which extended the term of existing copyrights by 20 years. And in the work that I was doing in the law of cyberspace, um, uh, speaking of architecture, is the architecture of not eating while I'm talking um, <laughs> a great one, Richard? Is that for people hungry? I'm, I'm kind of a little. I'm feeling guilty about. No, I've eaten, so that's fine. <laughs> um, maybe I'll just close this pretty quickly, and then we can come come back for questions or something. Does that make sense? Um, uh, anyway, um, I'm taking your lead. I'm trying to take your lead, but you're not giving me a signal. So, okay, I'll keep going. Uh, <laughs> um, so Congress passes this, this, this extension of copyright. And, um, and the work that I was doing about the law of cyberspace, copyright was one of the most interesting domains. Because copyright law is a law that is, embeds all sorts, of nor all sorts of public policy principles, like copyright terms are supposed to be limited, or in America there's fair use. But as you implement copy in the, copyright in the context of cyberspace, the code could take away some of those values. So the term is supposed to be limited, but you can use technology to effectively mean the control over copyrighted material is perpetual, because you can just lock it in DRM and nobody can get access to it. Or it the law could say there's fair use, the ability to take a little clip out and do something with it, but the code could take away fair use by basically blocking the ability of people to take stuff out and do stuff with it. So the point is, here was the best example of the way in which code could conflict with the law's policy. And so it forced you to think about how do we achieve the objectives, the policy objectives of the law, given this capacity of the code to conflict with it. So copyright was something that, you know, when I first started teaching, I knew nothing about, but became increasingly interesting to me as an example of this trade-off between law and code. But when Congress passed the Sunny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act, my experience as a constitutional lawyer kicked in, and I looked at the statute, and I looked at our Constitution, which says that Congress has the power to promote the progress of science by securing for limited times exclusive rights to authors for their writings, and thought that if Congress had the power to extend a copyright, the constraint of limited times may, means nothing, because you know, each time the limited time is about to expire, they can just extend it, so effectively the term could be perpetual. Um, so, uh, and also, from the perspective of the theory of copyright, it made no sense to allow Congress to extend the term of existing copyright. Because if copyright is about creating incentives, the one thing we know about incentives is that they're prospective. No matter what the United States Congress does, George Gershwin is not going to produce anything more. So even you can't extend the term of a copyright and get more creativity 50 years ago. You can extend the term of copyright and get more creativity from now on, but that means for work that isn't yet created, not for existing copyright. So it could make no sense to extend the term of existing copyright. Um, so from a policy perspective and from an originalism perspective, this statute seemed to make no sense. So very naively, very liberal law professor-like, my thought was, let's challenge this in the courts and get to the Supreme Court and get the Supreme Court to declare this law unconstitutional and establish constitutional limits in the context of copyright because Congress certainly doesn't respect any such limits in the context of copyright because both Democrats and Republicans get an enormous amount of money from the copyright industries to give them whatever they want. So we launched a case, El uh, Eldred versus Ashcroft, um, lost in the district court, lost in the Court of Appeals, but miraculously the Supreme Court granted cert, which in the, in the, in the American judicial system, cert is, uh, is optional. Uh, the Supreme Court has, has a discretion over its docket, so it picks which case it's going to hear, and it typically doesn't pick a case unless there's a good chance it's going to reverse it. Um, so we were very surprised the court took the case. Um, and, uh, and we argued uh, this case in the early 2000, so the case was argued in 2002 in the Supreme Court challenging the extension of copyright. And the basic argument we made was historical. The framers intended to limit copyright. This is inconsistent with the framers. And from a policy perspective, Copyright's about creating incentives. You can't create incentives retrospectively. And supporting us on the policy grounds was a brief signed by um, uh, six, Nobel Pri six Nobel Prize winning economists, most of them right-wing conservatives. Milton Friedman was the lead author in the brief. Um, Friedman said he would only sign the brief if the word no-brainer was in the brief somewhere. So <laughs> obvious was it that you couldn't extend the term of existing copyright and advance any public good. Um, but the Supreme Court looked at the history and said, well, 
you know, maybe, but Congress has consistently extended the term of existing copyrights over the last 200 years, so we're not going to reverse that tradition, so you lose. Um, so this naive thought we would raise to the Supreme Court and get the Supreme Court to radically change the scope of Congress's power was naive. I guess that's the characterization of it. But at the same time, it was clear that most Americans, most people who thought about it, had no clue about what was at stake in these copyright debates. So at the same time we launched the case to the Supreme Court, we also launched a more social movement to get people to think and recognize why it was important to to get, um, to get progress in how people thought about, uh, I'd get progress in limiting the way in which copyright was, ex was regulating people's lives. Um, uh, when we first launched the case, um, basically every newspaper that wrote about it thought that we were nuts and there was no purpose in limiting copyright. Um, why shouldn't Disney own Mickey Mouse forever? Like the whole public education was very, very backward on this issue. Um, uh, and in the case itself, by the end of the process of the case, um, uh, we had achieved some, at least some understanding around that issue. I remember I was, I was at a wedding in Hollywood and I was sitting next to an agent at one of the, at CAA, one of the leading agencies in Hollywood, and the agent, the publicity publicist said to me, so who was your publicist on this case? And because it was amazing. When you guys first brought this case, everybody thought you should lose. And by the time the Supreme Court heard the case, everybody thought you should win. So who was the publicity guy behind this? And I said, you know, we actually didn't have a publicity guy. <laughs> um, it's possible people just figured out what the right answer was here by being you know, told what the facts were. And that, seemed, that was a kind of opportunity. It seemed to me that there was a reason to try to persuade people. So at the same time the Supreme Court was considering Eldred, we launched Creative Commons. And the objective of Creative Commons was as much as a public education exercise as it was a set of tools to enable artists to mark their creative work with a different kind of copyright regime. So artists under the traditional copyright regime took an all rights reserved expression to their copyright and the, set up the frame as if the choice was between respecting copyright or not respecting copyright. Creative Commons gave people a way to say some rights reserved. So um, someplace between these two extremes and begin to develop a practice of people demonstrating the importance of being between these two extremes. Um, and that movement launched um, literally a, a month before the Supreme Court decided Eldred against us. <coughs> the day the Supreme Court decided Eldred against us, the Hewlett Foundation walked into my office and gave us a million dollars to push Creative Commons. Um, <coughs> and so, you know, it was a good day and it was a bad day. Uh, uh, and, uh, and with that million dollars, we seeded uh, the development of the Creative Commons project, which, which um, very quickly became an international project. And now there are, there are uh, ju project jurisdiction groups in more than uh, 80 jurisdictions around the, around the world, um, including most prominently here, uh, Creative Commons uh, New Zealand, um, which Richard and Jane have been enormously important in pressing and the extraordinary links that I guess were first set with the labor government but have continued in the national government to include this set of principles of freedom for creative work has been extremely important to the movement internationally to be able to point to what's happened in New Zealand and a couple other government relation examples around the world has encouraged many around the world to expand this including in the United States. Um, the Obama administration embraced Creative Commons on the website of the, White, of the White House and increasingly pushed it inside of the administration. And in part, it was because other sensible governments had done something like this too. And, and so this has been an important process of feeding off each other. Okay. But about f three years ago, I sort of had this moment of, um, you know, we all have this getting old moment and I was a little bit precocious about it, so I felt um, three years ago I was going to recognize getting old. And I made, uh, I had this couple of thoughts. Number one, this movement of people pushing for this more balanced regimes around copyright uh, was extremely healthy and vibrant. There were an enormous number of young people in it who were involved in doing all sorts of great things to think about it in all across the world, in England and in Germany and in the United States, South Africa, um, Asia. So it was a healthy movement. And it was increasingly winning in the public sphere. So parents and teachers and um, businesses and 
Um, all sorts of people who before didn't seem to get the issue were increasingly getting the issue, understanding what was at stake, understanding the need for change and the craziness of the existing regime. So it felt like on one side we were making great progress, but whenever I turned to policymakers in the United States, um, as distinct from in other places around the world, but in the United States, it was as if nothing had happened for 10 years. They didn't even know there was another side to the issue. 